Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. The Spirit was at work all the way along the line. It's almost like the Spirit has the initiative at the birth, at the conception, at the birth, at the baptism, and throughout the public ministry, and in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Interesting, uh, I think, reversal. And of course, what that would do if we went with that is it would make our own Christian piety much more Spirit-centered. Today on Reflections, Father Basic talks with Sister Geraldine Nowak, who is pastoral associate at St. Ignatius Parish. Father Basic and Sister Nowak will discuss the Holy Spirit, the source of unity. And now, here's Father Basic. Geraldine, I find myself uh, naturally searching you out when I want to talk about uh, the spiritual life and the sort of general rhythms of growth in the spiritual life. I feel that you have a really healthy sense of all of that, and therefore I would like to uh, probe that a little bit. I'd like to talk about the Holy Spirit as being the animator of our spiritual life, the Holy Spirit, uh, the one who, who brings us together, who helps form the bonding that we feel uh, among those who are serious about the spiritual life. And so perhaps uh, to get that started, I, I might think in terms of, of the problem that the Spirit is the response to, and part of that problem is a sense of division, of separateness. I could go back to our general sense of alienation, of feeling cut off from other people. It's the problem of, of, ma of finding it hard to communicate, of not being able to talk at a very deep level with people, of sort of hungering for someone who would understand us in depth, or wanting to be with people who uh, could share our joys and comfort us in the middle of our sorrows. And in the midst of that strong longing for unity, we find all of this estrangement, this cutting off, this inability to reach across barriers. We find uh, the, often the walls are very high and people need to defend themselves and people are not in touch with the deeper things of life, find it hard to talk about them. I suppose we can even go beyond the personal level and start talking about that in terms of groups. So we get factions developing within parishes, for example or we get interest groups in the country that seem to be opposed to one another. We get big fights going over policy issues. And we get an international situation where nations war against one another. So it seems like this estrangement, either personally or at a societal level, is a great part of the human problem and uh, something that the work of the spirit is called to counteract. Well, that's the frame I'd like to begin to look at this in. That's an exciting um, point of view, and I guess as you mentioned, the um, the factions that arise, I have to automatically, while I acknowledge that and want to be realistic, I do acknowledge that those ideas exist. If I am to do anything about those, or if I need to feel motivated about any of that, I need to look for examples within the world where maybe people have done the about face. They've begun by realizing what their gifts are and people have come together and the result is something that's phenomenal. For example, um, a couple years ago, a, just a, a woman in Denver had the idea that in regard to the peace issue, wouldn't it be a, a great thing if people could articulate in an artistic way, by way of a banner, um, what would they feel like if, for example, nuclear war happened, what would be lost? And this project became known as the Peace Ribbon. People articulated in various ways, and the idea was that um, that they were going to um, take and present this last August, and would surround the the building in Washington with with the Peace Ribbon. That very project, to me, is an example of um, what it means to come together out of one's gifts and to create something beyond one's wildest imagination and. Uh, so we have, you know, at this point in time, the peace ribbon that is in the Chicago Museum. That, that to me, is an example of how to yes. get motivated to, you know, take care of those factions or take care of those issues which are divisive. Right, and that grew out of the inspiration in the hearts of uh, a few people, really. You know, Geraldine, I was thinking about another example of that, and that's the Hands Across America uh, event. Um, 
that uh, this is a, a marvelous uh, kind of thing, uh, the people holding hands all the way across our country as a, as a way of demonstrating care for those who are hungry in the world and uh, thinking about the poverty question. And boy, what a marvelous symbol that is of this togetherness, of this uh, coming together. And that grows again out of the creative inspiration of a few groups. Uh, uh, and individuals, and uh, again represents not only the empowerment of the Spirit, but something of what the Spirit is supposed to accomplish, that is, a reaching out, a holding, a being with, a sense of solidarity as one faces one of the, the major kind of problems in life that uh, I think will shape the consciousness in a sense, this grand event of holding hands across the country. That's really exciting, and I, I think that that will, you know, become a part of our consciousness, that symbol that maybe will help us in our own ordinary life or within our family to be able to say that we can come together. That large of a project, um, I think, you know, can come right back to the home and where there might be some faction in the home, people can say, take that by example and say, well, there are the things that, that separate us. Why can't we lay those aside? They're still there. We might not ever resolve them, but aren't there issues that, that are the ones that we can come together on? And again, um, I don't just think of that in secular terms. I think that that really is some power, again, beyond ourselves that would occasion all that to happen. I think it's some power uh, beyond um, people's selves that will allow them to come forth at that given time and join hands across America. That's just phenomenal. And that other power that you're talking about, we commonly call the Holy Spirit, uh, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the power of God at work in the world. And uh, that really links up um, with our whole understanding theologically and the whole history of the church, the great importance of the Spirit. Before I launch along those lines, though, Geraldine, I want to go back to what I think is a, is a problem, and that is that uh, when you start putting it in the home, the family, in, in uh, the business site, uh, the people we're with all the time, what it seems to occur to me is a certain abrasiveness. That is, we not only learn how to link hands, but we learn how to wound one another. We learn what the other person's vulnerable points are. We know uh, what it is about them that we don't like. I often think that, you know, this period of time you can be with another person, a certain amount of limited interaction, and it's all sort of nice, and you put your f best foot forward, and you encounter the other person sort of at their best or at their public best or with their general facades or whatever ways we meet the other people. But it's only after a period of time and in close proximity that those uh, facades can no longer be operative. And we learn not only the good parts of the other person, but also the character traits that bug us. We learn what is abrasive about that. And we learn how our personalities don't just uh, mesh, that they are in conflict. And therefore, it, it seems, uh, strangely enough, harder very often to be good to reach out to those people we're closest to. It seems as though they propel in us an emotion that is often uh, very um, at polar opposite, something that, I mean, hate is a very strong word, but it becomes a, a, a way of saying they bug me or they hurt me or they I can't be indifferent to this person because they mean so much to me, and therefore when they don't treat me well, I'm then out of sorts and I may strike out or withdraw in my relationship to them. So when we're starting to talk about the power of the Spirit, I suppose one of the questions is not only can the Spirit enable us to hold hands across America or work for peace, but can it overcome this hurt that so often occurs in the intimate kind of relationships? I wonder if that lies um, with being inspirited to the point of being able to accept differences. And that, to me, that even seems that there's, there's a certain power that is needed just to... Um, First of all, acknowledge differences, and then um, accept differences, and then once that's done, one can then um, sort of move together in harmony with one's gifts. Um, but I like the idea of, um, um, I believe Carol Stumler says that, you know, when we're talking about the spirit, that once again we go back to that scriptural image of um, the one body and it has various members, or that um, the idea, too, of, of the spirit giving different gifts and that when we're thinking of a given group of people, because we do have the Spirit within us, we have several gifts, 
So it becomes very realistic then that there will be factions. And I like that sense of realism because I think that we can become out of balance and things can become so utopian that when that faction does arise in the parish or that um, that tension is in the family home that, uh, you know, one can sort of almost feel that one isn't living the life of the spirit, and yet precisely it is. And you can end up uh, with excessive and neurotic guilt feelings growing out of that, or a sense of failure and limitation, something that really needs to be overcome. That's one of my main reasons for interjecting the realistic theme, because that is the world we have to deal with. It's a world of limitations, of struggle, of abrasiveness, and a sort of hard, sweaty business of figuring out how to overcome that. I always like to start with the fact that Gustav Weigel once said, all things human given enough time go badly. And uh, I, that is an interesting sort of phrase, but uh, all things human, when they are very intimate, and close over a long period of time are bound to produce uh, rough spots. It just seems built into it. And the question becomes, then, what do we do about it? If you start out with figuring that that will happen, that estrangement is part of the human condition, that's what we mean by accepting the doctrine of original sin, which is, in a sense, an empirical doctrine. It's one that is verifiable in human experience. And the human original sin means that there is estrangement, alienation built into ourselves, into our relationship with others, and into our relationship with God. Then the key question in life becomes, very realistically, how do I overcome that? How do I move beyond it? How do I somehow get that abrasiveness into a manageable state so it is not messing our relationship up entirely? That's where we begin to see the, the great power of the Spirit, as you suggested, that draws us out of our selfishness and helps us transcend our limitations. And, and that marvelous word empowers us to do better and to build the bridges and to break down the barriers. And maybe the uh, the door that sort of accomplishes that is the idea of communication. I feel that um, when divisiveness is present and when gifts are present and we need to go beyond, then um, communication is the vehicle that can accomplish that and that how broad, whether that's on a personal level, a family level, a national level, or international world scene, um, to not reduce it maybe in a simplistic way, but just the idea of um, the importance of communication and to understand the, the thought pattern of those that we are dealing with. I don't think it's simplistic at all. In fact, there's important uh, philosophers and uh, social analysts today who want to put communication at the very center of their understanding of human existence, that it is the key to human living. It, it is really how we come to know who we are and how we affirm and challenge other people, that some have suggested that we live a, in a communicative network, that that's what our experience really is. It's not me as a subjective person isolated from everything else than having these various discrete experiences. But ex to be an experienced person means we are living in relationship and a communicative network where the great tool is dialogue. I may be going to make that far more concrete than that little speculative excursion into the world of philosophy there, but I often tell people who are you know, preparing for marriage that it's hard to predict exactly what the problems will be. But the point is, is to have a tool to deal with them no matter what comes up. And that t tool really is communication. It is that refinement of communication that we call dialogue, where two people are searching for a truth greater than they currently possess, where they're trying to, on the basis of trust, come to appreciate the other in a new way. So I believe that that is actually a very deep analysis of where we s it stands with us humans. And it becomes, as you suggested, the door, the tool, the mechanism for dealing with the estrangement that's built into the human condition. Geraldine, I've been uh, thinking about the, this and how we relate this really to the whole biblical world of the spirit, and I, I think it's important to do that. What we've been talking, I suppose, is in terms of an analysis of the human condition, of just looking at our own experience and that of others. But what we like to think is that the scriptures throw light on this, that the Bible helps us to understand it in greater depth. And that's, I think, very helpful to take a little look at how the Spirit is portrayed in the Scriptures. I'm remembering the way that the, the Spirit descended upon the prophets, for example. 
and the prophets out of the power of the Spirit would speak the judgmental word, thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord to live in this estranged condition isn't right. To live with this alienation brought on by the idols that we create in our world isn't right. That we need to call ourselves back to covenant, as they said, to community to this fundamental uh, agreement made with God. I will be your God and you will be my people. So the prophetic word is an s- empowered word, empowered by the Spirit, helps draw people together. And that uh, prophetic word, we keep seeing it, uh, and that, uh, that power of the Spirit is played through what we call our Christian scriptures, our New Testament as well. It's interesting, you can trace the whole story of Jesus this way. The Spirit is present at the conception of Jesus. It's the Spirit that overshadows shadows the Virgin Mary so that Jesus is conceived. It's, it's the spirit that's present at the birth of Jesus. Uh, the spirit is the one who comes down upon Jesus at his baptism uh, by John. And then it's the spirit that drives him out into the desert. You know, it's the spirit that leads him finally to Jerusalem and to surrender his whole being to the Father. And then out of that, this, the resurrection is the Jesus spirit being poured out on others. Then we think of Pentecost as the outpouring of the Spirit. So you can trace the whole story of Jesus. It almost sounds, when you look at it like that, that the real initiative is from the Spirit. In other words, we often think of it the other way, like we center on Jesus and Christ is the center for us and He gives us the Spirit. But the way I just try to analyze it reverses it and says, no, look, the Spirit was at work all the way along the line. It's almost like the Spirit has the initiative at the birth, at the conception, at the birth, at the baptism, and throughout the public ministry, and in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Interesting, uh, I think, reversal. And of course, what that would do if we went with that is it would make our own Christian piety much more Spirit-centered. And that's foreign. I mean, that's not the way we usually think. We are more Christocentric, centered on Jesus Christ. But we could become more uh, centered on the Spirit, and I think that would be healthy for us. The Eastern Orthodox have a much greater sense of that. So we are divinized in their thought. The Greek fathers had it the way the Spirit is within us. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. Spirit lives inside of us and helps to um, bring us to God, makes us uh, the partners of God in the whole work of sanctification. Uh, I was in a conversation recently with people who needed to articulate their image of God, and I was particularly impressed with uh, a young lady who described her image of God as Trinitarian and had a nice uh, sense of being able to move as life moves within ordinary everyday events, from picturing God as creator to picturing God as Lord to picturing God as spirit. So it's um, a, a certain sense of integration about w- one's image of God has to do with including the spirit then and uh, possibly a reflection as as you articulated the scriptures and how the spirit was present within Jesus's life it would be uh, that sort of almost uh, makes me want to go and sit down and reflect and say when was the spirit active in my life and to pinpoint those uh, life experiences that I would have my own sense then to to make those scriptures live for myself. That would be a very valuable thing to do and one way I think as we would try to do that we would direct ourselves to the places where the barriers were broken down, the places where we somehow received an impulse to reach out and help some other person, to where we created bondings. I think it's as simple as an experience of sitting in a room and realizing a stranger walks in and looking up and smiling at them or saying hello to someone or or at a party who seems to be shy and sit down and talk with them for a while to much larger kinds of things like holding hands across America and of uh, working for peace at an international level. But it's all got that same flavor of we're one human family. We are all inspirited. We are all empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are members of the one body of Christ in which the Spirit is the soul of that body and holds it together. Once we have that sense of idealism, of that larger picture of life, then the barriers seem out of place. Uh, the, the estrangement seems like, well, it shouldn't be like this. I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, we got this difficulty of communicating and reaching and touching and getting together, but it's wrong. I, I don't, I'm out of kilter then. I don't feel right in a group where the tension level is high and where 
people dominate or where others are left out. It's not the way human life should be lived. Maybe we come to know that by our good experiences of the Spirit, the times when we felt together and where another person accepted us and liberated us and uh, where we knew that estrangement was not the last word. It's been quite an eye-opener for me to reflect on those experiences and to think about the dynamic of, of love, maybe scripturally, you know, realizing the commandment to love one another as, as God has loved us, and that um, one of the spiritual writers refers to the idea that the opposite of love is not hatred but fear. And so when oftentimes I think that divisiveness occurs or someone is not able to... Um, communicate that it's really fear at work and then that fear causes that causes that sense of isolation so we see those boundaries and we see those barriers so it's a it's a great reflection to reflect to think about um, one's own life and maybe the great amounts of fear and that when we buy into that you know we are creating those boundaries and we are creating uh, you know those decisive uh, elements and um, just an interesting dynamic to think of the opposite of love as fear because again those wonderful things that have happened that are so exciting or so energizing or so uh, beyond our wildest imagination really come across through a spirit of love and not fear no isolation and then we have that biblical notion Geraldine that the spirit casts out fear it, it is precisely the spirit that overcomes the fear and uh, helps us to uh, take those risks and uh, overcome our isolation and barriers. That's a, that's a really important idea. It's one of the ways the scriptures link up with our psychology and help uh, explain the greater depth that's involved here. Now, the other notion I was thinking of is the, the whole idea of how we understand the church. Because what we say is the church really has its birth in a way at Pentecost, that it is a born in the very outpouring of the Spirit, that uh, when the Spirit is poured out upon the disciples, then we have the community formed, the group that lives this uh, common life and worships together and helps to serve others out of the Spirit that, is, that they have uh, felt and known within their group. So that um, we could then think of this church as animated by the Spirit throughout all of history, but we could also think of the Spirit, I mean, of the, as the church of the church as the sacrament of the Spirit. So there's a sort of a new model of the church that many people are suggesting these days. So we've been very familiar with other models like church as institution, as community, as herald, as servant, as sacrament. And now, it's usually sacrament of the risen Lord. That's what we've usually meant. Church is sacrament or sign, symbol of the risen Christ. But now we could also think of the church as the sacrament of the Spirit. And when you start talking about the church like that, I think certain notions jump up at you. One is that there's a certain fluid boundary to it, that it's harder to exactly say who's in and out which is, reflects our real experience. I mean, it's hard to often know who belongs and who doesn't. Uh, there's some, maybe some inactive people we think of, but who are living a rich life of the Spirit, for example. What was Augustine's phrase? That God has many that the church doesn't have, or that has, and vice versa. And uh, so that uh, you could say as many people in the church who God doesn't have, that is, they're not animated by the Spirit, but uh, when we begin to reflect on the community as sacrament of the Spirit, then it puts us in a different mind here. It focuses on the internal, on, on the real responsiveness to the call of God, on a, on a community that's exciting, that's vibrant, alive, that's welcoming, that you'd like to join up with, that makes a difference in the world. I sort of like that image. I think it's got great potential here for uh, opening up new slants on what the church is. I think of... Um two things current. One, the um, movement, I don't know how recent it is, maybe we're just saying it in different words or we're trying to uh, get a better grasp on it, but the whole effort at um, collaboration in ministry. Um, maybe this Church of the Spirit, you know, can focus in that direction and that certainly seems to acknowledge and operate out of people's gifts. Uh, we're operating out of, um, you know, once again, sort of um, what the Spirit has given each person. Or uh, I guess I'm also thinking about uh, that sort of clicks in my mind with um, the bishop's document, the called and gifted. And within that document, um, the call to holiness that's universal and the call to adulthood, the call to community. 
and the call to ministry that this servant or spirit church um, becomes very, very exciting because we're operating out of our giftedness rather than our woundedness. A good point. We often call those gifts these days the charisms. That's the Greek word that was used in the New Testament for the gifts given by the Spirit. The charisms mean a free gift of the Spirit that's given for the common good, given for the building up of the body of Christ. And so what we would end up saying, I think, that out of baptism we all have our own charisms and uh, all therefore have something to contribute to the well-being of the church and society. And that, as you suggest, I think becomes an exciting idea. There's really no room for passivity or dependency within the church. We're all supposed to be active, contributing members. And that would give us a whole different sense of what the church is about. And the um, the historical, when you mentioned charisms, I'm reminded of... um just the idea of charisms throughout history and all those various people that came forth with their charism and it's a part of our history and that the exciting thing is that um, that we can help create that at this point in time and understanding that charism that you know it's never given unless it's for the, the you know the common good and certainly um, to work at the spirit church that model would certainly be something to articulate articulate in my fantasy or conception something that would be extremely life-giving Yes, and uh, would, uh, we would hope would be attractive, therefore. And other people would say, again, we'll see how those people try to love one another because they're animated by the power of the Spirit. And that, uh, I do find that to be an attractive image as well. Geraldine, is there anything else that uh, you wanted to get in here? You have exactly one minute to do this in. You've uh, gotten your say on the Spirit, have you? you? The Spirit will probably move you to say something else as I start, but I think maybe I could try to uh, summarize uh, a bit of where we have been. I know the emphasis has been on the Spirit as a source of unity, and we've had marvelous images of that. From your, What was your image about the peace thing? We had the peace ribbon. And yeah, the, the peace ribbon, and then there and is the marvelous event of the hands across America, which I think will shape our consciousness in a new way. And then we try to link all of that with the story in the scriptures, the way the Spirit was at work in the life of Jesus, and all different ways. The Spirit was what enabled him to preach well and to heal. And uh, finally, in his resurrection, he becomes life-giving spirit. And you kept taking us back all the time to the way it works in our lives today, helping us in tiny ways to reach out, overcome our selfishness, and try to build up uh, the bridges and create a community then that really could be a sacrament of the spirit. been listening to Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. Today, Father Basic talked with Sister Geraldine Nowak, who is pastoral associate at St. Ignatius Parish. The topic of this week's Reflections was the Holy Spirit, the source of unity. If you have any comments on today's show or suggestions for future programs, please write Father James Basic, Catholic campus minister, 2086 Brookdale Drive, Toledo, Ohio, 43606. Funding for this program was provided by the Catholic Communications Commission of the Diocese of Toledo.